Hello, and welcome to the CCF Online Channel. We are excited for you to be part of another worship experience. We pray that what you learn here today will deepen your relationship with Jesus. Enjoy the message. Good evening. We will now uh, end uh, chapter 2. But before I do that, uh, let me just... Uh, the last Olympics, which is in uh, Brazil, the Philippines, uh, finally, for so many years, we won a medal, okay? So in weightlifting, okay? So there is that uh, lady at the right side uh, who won the medal for the Philippines. I think, it, I don't know how many years that we are able to win a medal, no? And if you notice, uh, we don't win so much uh, medals in the Olympics because our problem is this. Unlike other countries, after the Olympic, the next day they start to practice for the next Olympics. And the gap between two, the Olympics is four years. So the next one will be 2020. Yung mga Pilipino, they will practice on 2020. Okay? <laughs> Not uh, because this happened on 2016. So the other countries are already practicing for the next Olympics. As a matter of fact, they try so hard, okay? to qualify in the Olympics. Years of preparation, years of training are absolutely essential. But even then, some of them still fail miserably and are disqualified. Tayo pa. Okay? So, why am I sharing that? Okay? Because uh, there is a much bigger event than the Olympics okay, that is coming. And all of us are participants to that event, okay? Do you know what event is that, okay? It is the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, okay? And this event is so amazing that uh, if you look at it, it will affect and shake the entire world, okay? Notice, listen to how it is described by Luke when Jesus comes again. He says, there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, in the stars, and on the earth dismay among nations, in perplexity at the roaring of the sea and the waves, men fainting from fear, and the expectation of the things which are coming upon the world for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Okay? He continues in verse 27, they, then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power, and great glory. But when these things begin to take place, straighten up and lift up your heads because your redemption is what? Drawing near, okay? If they prepare for the Olympics this coming 2020, all these athletes from the other nation, and if Jesus is coming, okay? Do you believe that Jesus is coming again? Do you know that there are more passages in scriptures about the second coming than the first coming? So if the first coming happened, all the more, the second coming will really happen. So my question to all of us tonight is this. Are you ready for this big event? Ask your neighbor, ask your, the person beside you, okay? Are you ready? If Jesus were to come next week, okay? Are you ready for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ? We have to be ready. I know that. But the question is, are you ready? True, we have to be ready. But the question is, are you ready? Okay? And maybe some of you might be thinking, I'm ready. Why? Because I've trusted by faith in what Jesus has done. He's my Savior. So I'm ready. Is that the thinking? Okay? In one sense, that is true. Okay? If you have trusted in Jesus, then maybe you're ready. Right? But the Bible teaches us that even as believers, we should be prepared. We should be preparing for his return, okay? If you look at the, uh, what Jesus said in Mark 13, 33 and 34, let me read that for all of us. He says, take heed, keep on the alert. Why? Because you do not know when the appointed time will come. And then he gives a story. He says, it is like a man on a journey, right? So uh, who upon leaving his house and putting his slaves in charge assigned to each one his task. 
He also commanded the doorkeeper, the one in charge of the door, to what? To stay on the alert. Why? Because, verse 35, therefore, he says, be on the alert. Why? For you do not know when the master of the house is coming. He can come in the evening, he can come at midnight, or he can come in the ro rooster crows or in the morning. In, and in case he should come suddenly, he says, and find you asleep, Jesus says, what I say to you, I say to all. What does he say to us? What is he telling us? Be on the alert. Okay? I believe the Apostle John heard Jesus speak these words. Okay? And so in the passage that we will be looking at, he will be warning us that we are in the last hour. We studied that last week. We're in the last hour. And there are many deceivers, false teachers, that are trying to lead us astray from the truth. Right? And so... There is that danger in the mind of the apostle. And so he gives us again, remember the book of 1 John, is, uh, he gives us different kinds of tests. Okay? And he does the cycle again. Let me just give you another cycle of what he's doing. Okay? 1 John 2, which we will cover, 28 and 29, he gives us the moral test up to chapter 3, verse 20. But we'll only look at the first two verses, or the last two verses of chapter 2. And then in chapter 3, verse 11 to 18, he now talks about relational tests. Remember in chapter 2, he says, if you really are a Christian, you will love the brother. You will not hate him. But if you hate the brother, you are still in darkness. So again, he does the relational test. Okay? And then he, he, he in chapter 3, verse, uh, that should not be 3, 11, but that should, in chapter 19, okay? John inserts a word about assurance. Just like what he did in chapter 2, he cuts off the test and he tells uh, he tells his reader about the stages of what? The Christian life. Okay? So, and then in 1 John chapter 4, verse 1 to 6, he goes back to the doctrinal test. Okay? So tonight we will look at the first part of the moral test. So are you ready? Okay? Let me read the passage for all of us. We look at these two verses tonight. Okay? Now, little children, John says, abide in him. Why? So that when he appears... We may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame at his coming. Verse 29. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who also who practices righteousness is born of God. And so tonight as we look at these two verses, it is my prayer that you are abiding in Jesus will experience the confidence that John is writing about. Notice he says, that you may have confidence. And it is my prayer that uh, you will really experience it in your heart. Okay? I also pray that uh, if there is anybody here who is not abiding, because what it says is, my little children abide in him. So if you are here in this room right now and you are not abiding in Jesus, I pray that you will also think about it. Okay? Because... Uh, if you're not abiding, if you're abiding in Jesus, it's an extraordinary, uh, there's a, there are promises that are given to people who are abiding in Christ. But if you are not, there is also the prospect for those who don't, and it is very terrifying. Okay? So that's my prayer. So my title tonight is this. Let's read this together. Go. To be ready for Christ's coming, abide in him as little children. So if you want to be ready... Remember, this is, a, this is a, an event that will happen that will shake the whole world. So you and I need to be ready. And for you to be ready, John is saying, readiness in, for the coming of Christ requires that you abide in him as little children. Where did I get the title? Okay, let's break these uh, verses down. Okay, now he says, now little children abide in him so that when he appears. The first thing I want us to understand is this. John is telling us that Jesus is coming again, okay? And the, the statement when he appears in the original language literally means this, if he appears, okay? The certainty is not about the fact of his coming. He is really coming, okay? But the uncertainty is about the time that he will come. So the issue is not 
will Jesus come or not? He will really come. But the issue is, when will he come? That's the issue, okay? So, the fact that he is coming bodily is either true or the Bible is false, okay? So, but the Bible tells us, as I've said a while ago, there are more passages of his second coming than the first coming. So, I believe in my heart, based on the authority of Scripture, that Jesus is coming again, okay? But the problem we have is we do not know when he will return. But definitely, he will really appear, okay? Now, do you know that uh, for uh, one verse in 25 verses deals with the Lord's return? It is mentioned 318 times in 260 chapters of the New Testament. It is mentioned in every one of the New Testament books with the exception of Galatians. Okay, why? Because Galatians deals with a particular doctrinal problem. And so even the short books like 2 John and 3 John and Philemon, which is only one chapter, they also talk about the coming of Jesus. And Jesus repeatedly talks about his return. Okay? If you have your Bible, okay, Turn to 1 Thessalonians. I don't have the, 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 the slides for that. Okay? In 1 Thessalonians, there are five chapters, right? 1 Thessalonians. If you read the last verse or the last two verses of uh, each chapter, it talks about the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Can somebody read the last two verses or the last verse of chapter 1? Can somebody read that? Who wants to volunteer to read that? First Thessalonians chapter 1, verse, the last verse. Okay, 9 ba or 10? Can somebody read? Okay, pakibasa nga. Yes, can you read? So to wait for the Son to come. That's again the coming of Jesus. Go to chapter 2, read the last two or three uh, verses. Who wants to read? Who wants to volunteer to read that? Mani, can you read that? So notice, Paul says, when our Lord Jesus comes, you go to chapter 3, look at the last few verses there. What does it say? Who wants to read that? Benji, can you read that? Okay. Okay. Uh, read that. Okay. Again, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Chapter 4, the same. Can somebody read the last... Uh, two or three verses there in that passage. Who wants to read that? Babae naman, siguro. Yes, can you read the last? Huh? Oh. Jesus is coming. He will be coming in the air and he will uh, take us, those who are dead, will be resurrected. Okay? We give him a, a spiritual body. Okay? Chapter 5. Okay? He wants to read the, the, the last uh, verse of chapter 5. Can somebody read that? Anybody? Volunteer? Waiting na lang ikaw. Ayan na nila waiting. Ikaw na lang waiting. <laughs> oh, oh, saan yung coming? May, may previous verse siguro. 20, ano? 23. Basahin mo, Andre. Ah, sige. Uh, 
at the coming. So in Thessalonians alone, all the chapters ends with what? The coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? So, the coming of the Lord is all over Scripture. And even Jesus, when he was still here in doing ministry, in John chapter 14, verse 3, what does he say? If I go and prepare a place for you in heaven, where God is, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. He's coming back, okay? Acts 1.11, the same. When Jesus ascended to heaven, they also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? Because Jesus ascended. This Jesus has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. Okay? So, first things first, you need to understand, John is telling us that Jesus will come again. Okay? When he appears. We don't know the time. But we know definitely he's coming. And when he comes, John tells us there are two kinds of people. There will be people who will have confidence of his second coming. And there will be people who will shrink away in, from him in shame at his coming. So when Jesus comes, the point is this. When Jesus Christ comes, some will be ready, but others will not be ready. And so there are only two possibilities when Jesus comes. Either you will have the confidence that when he comes, or you will shrink away from him in shame. Kaya, I want to ask you, check yourself. Examine your lives, okay? If you really believe that Jesus is coming again, will you have that confidence or will you shrink away from him in shame? Okay? Kasi sabi niya, dalawa lang daw eh. Two possibilities. Okay? Now, the question is this. When he says that those people will shrink away in shame in his coming, is John referring to believers who will be ashamed at the Lord's coming? Or is he referring to heretics who follow their denial of the deity of Jesus Christ? What do you think? When he says, there will be people who will shrink away in shame. Is he referring to us, believers, or is he referring to the false teachers? What do you think? Most likely, I believe, it seems that the primary reference in the context is he is referring to those heretics, those false teachers who deny that, that Jesus Christ is God. Okay, for, while, for a while, uh, they profess to know Jesus, but remember last week, what happened to them? They went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out so that, why? It would be shown that they are all are not of us. So, but by the way, I told you, if you were not here last week, I told you when people transfer churches, they are not, that is not uh, what John is referring to, okay? Kasi, oh, umalis na siya, he went out of CCF. They are not of us, huh? okay? No, 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 that is not the meaning there. I shared with you last week, if people transfer, it is sad that people transfer, okay? Maybe there are issues that happen inside the church, so they left, but I would strongly suggest if you are really part of CCF, you're part of the family of Christ, in the family there will be friction. If, you're, if you have a family, if you're married, if you have children, some of our children sometimes quarrel, right? But it does not mean that they don't become part of our family. So when there are frictions and conflicts and trouble, we teach you that you need to reconcile, right? So it's sad that some people are not willing to reconcile and they want to move to another church, okay? So we're just moving the problem to another church, okay? So it's always better when people come here and say, Pastor Bob, I'm from this church, and I always ask, why are you transferring, okay? Why are you transferring? I'm not saying we will, we will not welcome transferees, but I want to understand why are they transferring? 
Because if they're transferring, because there's a conflict in the church, I will always tell them, go back and reconcile first. When that is reconciled, ask permission from your pastor, I'm moving to this church, and you come. Okay? But if your reason for transferring is you are not anymore growing, then I welcome people like that. Okay? I remember in Jensen when a few men and women suddenly moved to CC, uh, in our uh, ministry there. And so I asked them, why are you here? Somebody said, you know, Pastor Bob, two years I've been praying to the Lord. Okay? And so what happened? I said, and God has impressed in my heart that I should leave our church and move to CCF. Are you sure that it is CCF? That God said, yes, I'm very sure. God told me that I should move to CCF. Not uh, the Jangas Baptist Church, not uh, Victory uh, Christian uh, Fellowship, not Green Hills Christian Fellowship here in Jensen. No, I'm very sure it is what? A message from God and God is telling me I should transfer to CCF. After a while, about a few weeks, about two, two months, I don't see them anymore. So I question, I ask myself, was it really God who spoke to her? Because if it was God who spoke to her and God is saying that you should be here in this church, CCF, why did you leave CCF? Understand? So I sense that they were just making a, you know, a reason that we are here because God told me. Right? And when their leader said, Let's, we will not be there, they just followed their leader and I saw them one time in a wedding. I wanted to ask them, I thought God spoke to you. That you should go to CCF. How come you are anymore in CCF? You see, understand? Okay? So, that is not what John means when he says, they went out from us. They moved to another church. That's not the one. Okay? What he's saying is, they are not really of us. They are not born again Christians. They are not followers of Jesus Christ. And so they left us because they are not really of us. Because if they were really followers of Jesus Christ, they would have remained with us. But they did not. Okay? They did not. But, it can also mean that it is possible that if you're a believer and when Jesus comes, you will also shrink away in shame. Is that possible? Because you did not prepare. Okay? Why do I say that? Because Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 12 and 13, is what he says. Now, if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, notice the kind of material. First, these are the expensive ones, gold, silver, and precious stones. Then he talks about wood, talks about hay, talks about straw, okay? So he's now comparing the works that we have done in the different uh, materials. And then he continues by saying, Paul says, each man's work will be what? Will become evident for the day will show it, okay? For the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire. And, when the, and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. So if your work is gold, what happens when you burn gold? It's still gold, right? Okay? And it will just become liquid if the heat is there. But the moment you remove the heat, it solidifies again and becomes gold again. Right? Now, if you burn wood or hay or straw, what happens? It becomes ashes, understand? So there are things that we are doing that when it is being tested, it will disappear. But there are things that we are doing, no matter what the fire you place into that material, like gold and silver, when you remove the fire, it's still gold and it is still silver, okay? So Paul says, verse 14, if any man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up like wood, uh, hay, and straw, he will suffer loss, okay? But he himself will be saved yet so as through fire. What is Paul saying? What Paul is saying is this. You can enter heaven, okay? Yun lang, as the door will close, it's like an elevator. Have you ever tried... You wanted to ride the elevator, and it's about to, the door's about to close, okay? And you will say, up, 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 okay, wherever you're going, okay? So, 
you try to enter the elevator just at the nick of time. Okay? That's the picture of what Paul is saying. When our work does not remain, you will go to heaven. Okay? You will go to heaven. Pero, o to finish. That's why, but he himself will be saved yet as so as through fire. When you're ready inside, umuusok yung likod mo. Intindihan nyo? Okay? Meaning, photo finish ka. Unlike others, when Jesus comes, they have the confidence. But others will shrink in shame. Okay? Notice, there are only two places. When Jesus comes, either you have confidence or you will shrink away in shame. Okay? In his coming. Now, by the way, the word coming, uh, beautiful meaning. Okay? Uh, it means you are, it's, that word is used of the visit of a king or an emperor. Okay? So when Jesus comes, okay, you are like going into a high, before a high-ranking official. And many times when you visit somebody who is high-ranking, how do you feel? Sometimes you're afraid, right? Sometimes it's, uh, it makes us nervous, Okay? Because even John, when he saw the glory of Jesus, he, he fell at his feet like a dead man. Okay? So, but here in this passage, John is saying, when Jesus comes, we have what? We may have confidence at his coming. Now, question. How can this be? Okay? Remember our title tonight? What's our title again? To be ready for Christ's coming, what must you and I do? Abide in him as little children. Okay? So, when he appears, he says, what must you and I do? So that we will have the confidence, John said, the purpose, okay? So that little children, we need to abide in him. Why? So that when Jesus appears, you and I will have the confidence. And this word abide is a favorite word of John, okay? Abide is one of his favorite words. And uh, he uses the word abide more than all the other New Testament writers combined, okay? Just in the book of 1 John, the word abide is mentioned 24 times, depending on your translation. And so when Jesus was in the upper room, he also used that 11 times. That's also a favorite of Jesus. And it is use of God's abiding in us and our abiding in him, okay? So when that word abide is used, Robert Law says this, there is a sense in which every true believer abides or remains in Christ. But the fact that we are commanded to abide in him implies what? Persistent and purposeful action on our part. Understand? Because we're commanded. It says abide in him so that when he appears, you will have the what? The confidence. So, when it is a command, I always tell all of you, it is not natural for us. That's why we are commanded to do it. It's like, uh, you know, like brushing our teeth. We're not commanded to brush our teeth. Bakit? Normal na. It's part of our system. But little children, we command them. So, did you brush your teeth? Why? It's not yet their second nature. So, when there is a command in Scripture, it means that it is not natural of us. Okay? So, the question now is this. What does it mean to abide in Christ? Okay? There are few meanings. Number one, to abide in Christ, you must be in Him, okay? For you to abide in Christ, you must be in Him, okay? What does that mean? It means this, as we are commanded to abide, the question is, have you trusted in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Because the moment you trust in Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are placed in Him, okay? You are now in Christ, okay? And so, this position of being in Christ comes to us through the new birth. Meaning, when we are born again, when we are born into God's family, then you are in Christ. So the question is, can you know that you are born again? Right? Okay? Because in John 1.13, John says you were born, you were born, not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man. This is not physical birth that he's talking about, but he's talking about but the contrast, we are born of God. Okay? 
So, my question to you is this. Have you experienced being born again? And the question you need to ask are the following. Have you truly trusted and are you now trusting in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation? If that is true to you, then you are born again. Another question that you need to ask yourself is this. Have you repented and are you now repenting of all of your sins? Because repentance is very important in salvation. Okay? Another question you need to ask is, do you love God and the things of God? Do you love God and the things of God? Uh, I'll be leaving tomorrow. By the way, you pray for me because they invited me to speak in the National Church Planting Conference for Luzon. So one of the messages is, uh, they asked me to give one of the messages, okay? And it's about uh, the Apostle Peter denying Jesus, remember? Three times. And then he went fishing because he was so depressed and uh, down and uh, he felt so bad about what he has done. And so Jesus now comes and restores him. How did Jesus restore the Apostle Peter? He asked him, do you love me? What was the response of Peter? Lord, I love you. Second time, he asked, Simon, son of John, do you love me? What was the answer of, uh, of Peter? Yes, Lord, I love you. The third time, Jesus asked him again, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He felt grief. Why? Because it was the third time that Jesus asked him, do you love me? Right? And so what happened? What was the response of Peter? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know all things. You know that I love you. Right? So, when, why is that important? Asking Peter if he loves the Lord. Imagine if Jesus were to ask all of us today, each one of you, do you love me? What will be your response? Do you love Jesus? He will tell you now. I'm assuming Jesus is here. And then he will ask you, do you love me? What will, how will you answer? Anong sagot ninyo? Yes. Ako, if he will ask me, I will ask, answer the same as Peter. Lord, you know everything. <laughs> you, know, you, you, know, you know me. You know that I love you. Right? But sometimes we don't understand what Jesus is asking of us. I want you now to imagine, okay? You are all reporters, okay? And you are now going to ask me a question. What is the question? You want to prove if I really love my wife, right? I've been married to my wife for 39 years. I have five, three children, five grandchildren. It will be our 40th anniversary next year. And so I, I tell all of you I love my wife, right? But you, being the reporters, your goal, your task, is to ask me questions to prove that I love my wife. Okay? So what questions will you ask me to prove that I really love my wife? Oh, sample tayo. What, what question will you ask me to really prove that I really love my wife? Huh? What, what? And then, yun nga ang question eh. But what other question will you ask to really prove if I really love my wife? Give me, a, give me a sample. Kayo yung mga nag interview eh. So, what will you ask me to prove that I love my wife? Huh? Okay. Are you honest and loyal to your wife? Is that a good question? To prove my love? Yeah. Ano pa? Huh? Are you faithful? Okay. Because if I love my wife, I should be faithful, right? What else? I know, I know, I know. What, 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 louder? Do I give her shopping allowance? Okay? Because if I love her, I will do things to please her, right? Ano pa? Are you re ready to die for her? Okay? To prove that I really love her, right? Now, let me reverse. I will now use the same questions and ask you if you really love Jesus. So I will ask the, the same question, okay? If you really love Jesus, 
Are you willing to die for Him? If you really love Jesus, will you be faithful to Him? If you really love Jesus, will you do things to please Him? If you really love Jesus, will you be loyal? Ano ba yung sabi niya? Loyal and ano may dalawang word yun eh. And honest to Him. Understand? You can ask so many questions to prove if I love my wife. But these same very questions will be also the very questions that I will ask all of you if you really love Jesus. That's why that, that issue of restoring Peter, using that question, Peter, do you love me, is really a proof that you are abiding in Christ because loving God, loving God, and loving the things of God is a proof Okay, and the proof of our loving are all of those things. Dying, faithful, doing things for the Lord. Okay? So, there are many signs, there are many manifestations if you have really been born again. Okay? And because if you are born again, you are in Christ. Okay? Second, what does it mean to abide in Christ? To abide in Christ is both passive and active at the same time. What do I mean? Because there's a popular teaching that if you're abiding, you will not strive anymore. You will not exert effort. You're just simply resting in all that Jesus is for you. Like what he said in John 15, 5. I am the vine. You are the what? The branches. And he says, he who abides in me and I in him, this is passive, you will bear much fruit. And for apart from me, you can do nothing. Okay? So, that is the passive, the passive side. But you need to also be doing the active in, in abiding. What do I mean? In 1 John chapter 2, verse 6, the one who says he abides in him, active, you need to do something. What is it? What should you do? You ought himself to walk in the same manner as Jesus walked. So, meaning... You're, you need to do something here. Okay? So, this is what we call the test of what? Obedience. Are you obeying Jesus? Are you walking the way Jesus walked? Okay? And then in uh, chapter 2, verse 10, the one who loves his brother, if you love the brother, you're abiding in the light. Okay? This is again the relational test. Okay? You need to do something. And then he says in John 2, 24, as for you, let that abide in you. What? What should abide in you? Which you have heard from the beginning. And if what you have heard from the beginning abides in you, you will what? You will abide in the Son and in the Father. This is what I call the test of holding tenaciously to the truth of the gospel. Because today, there is so much pressure okay, from the world that's why people try to water down the gospel. Kasi na, natatako tayo eh. We are being pressured. And so what do we do? We water down the gospel. Okay? So, that is the meaning when I say, when you abide in Christ, it is both passive and active at the same time. You do something. Okay? Test of obedience, test of uh, relationship, test of really holding on to the truth. Another meaning of what does it mean to abide in Christ? To abide in Christ means to live righteously. Okay? Notice in the passage, in verse 29, what does he say? If you know that he is righteous, and you know that everyone also who practices righteousness is born of him. Now, John is saying, if you know that he is righteous, that word if has the sense of you can replace it. By the word sins, okay? So if means sins. There, may, there are four classes of if, and here it is sins. You can change it to sin. Since you know, this is not something that is not uh, sure. It is already sure. That's why this if is, can be translated to the word sins. Since you know that he is righteous. Okay? Now the question is this. Uh, to whom is the he referring to? To whom? Is it referring to Jesus? 
Because we know in chapter 2, verse 2, Jesus is what? Is righteous. It can refer to Jesus, okay? Who is the subject in verse 28, okay? When he appears, the he, he there is Jesus, when Jesus appears. And when you study the Bible, when there are uh, difficulty to determine if it is the Father or Jesus Christ, usually uh, based on Bible study methods, the nearest verse, and if that verse refers to Jesus, the nearest verse is the basis for interpreting that the he there is Jesus Christ, okay? Now, but we also know that born of him, right? Because the him there can mean the father because who causes us to be born again? Who? God. Remember in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 4? Because of the great love of, because of his great love and because of his mercy, uh, because of his mercy and because of his great love with which he loves us, while we were dead in our transgression, he, meaning God, made us alive together with Christ by grace. We are saved. So, it can also refer to him because if you look at the next verse in chapter 3, verse 1, which is connected actually, which we'll study next week, see how great a love what? the Father has bestowed upon us. So, he there can also mean the Father, but it can also mean the Son, okay? So, going back to the passage, you know, you know that He is righteous, and so therefore, you know that everyone also who practices righteousness is born of God. Now, what John is saying is simply this. If you're really born of God, if you're a child of God, there's a saying like Father, like Son, because God is righteous and you are a child of God, therefore you should also be practicing righteousness. Okay? Why? Because we share His nature. Okay? So, living righteously is a lifelong process of growth in obedience to God's Word. Okay? So, number four, another meaning of to abide in Christ. To abide in Christ means to Again, I told you to hold firmly to the truth of the word, especially to the truth of the gospel. Remember that passage I shared with you? Whatever you heard in the beginning, hold on to that. What you heard from the beginning abides in you. So, the test of holding tenaciously to the truth of the gospel. Because I told you that there are pressures, okay, that sometimes we compromise. Okay? Another meaning of to abide in Christ. To abide in Christ means to be at home with him and to be an alien to this world. Okay? Because if you really love him, the Father, Jesus Christ, you are in him. Remember, it says in verse 15, do not what? Do not love the world nor the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So you ask yourself now, Okay. Do you love the world more than the things of God? Some Paul, would you prefer to be watching TV or scrolling your Facebook maybe half a day okay, than reading your Bible? Because if you spend two hours in your gadgets and you cannot even spend five minutes in his word, something is wrong. But if you're really abiding in him, you will desire the things of God. Okay? I thank the Lord that you're here because you want to know him. You're attending Bible studies. Okay? And I told the class, uh, I think three weeks ago, four weeks ago, we are 1,000 plus attendees and regular attendees here in CCF for the three services, and there are only two, three, four, five, forty lang tayo siguro, di ba? So, forty out of one thousand two hundred. See, folks, I'm not saying that uh, they love the world. Maybe their schedules are really, but if you really love God, if you really are abiding in Him, you want to know him even more. You will spend time studying the Bible. If Bible studies are offered, you will come. 
Okay? And uh, I challenge all of you. If you have not read the whole Bible, make that a goal this next year, starting June. Hopefully by June next year, you have read the whole Bible. Reading pa lang yun. You are not yet studying. Okay? So, uh, so, there is a difference between reading and studying. I read the Bible every year. Okay? I read the Bible. And I make it a point to read the Bible every year. But I make it a goal also to study at least two books in the Bible. Okay? Two books. We are now studying the book of James with my small group in, in uh, Jensen. We're still in chapter one. Okay? So, we have been in chapter one for uh, maybe three months. So, meaning, meaning what? We're really digging line by line, word by word. Okay? Because we want to understand what James is talking about. Okay? So, to abide, uh, to be ready for Christ's coming, you need to what? Abide in Him. Okay? Abide in Him. But you need to abide in Him as what? Little children. What does that mean? Okay? Because He says, little what? Little children abide in Him. You know already what abiding means? So that when Jesus comes again, you will not shrink away, but you will have the confidence to face Him. So the question I want to answer now is, you already answered what it means to abide in Him. How do you abide as a little child? Right? Because He mentions little children. Eh? Okay? And you know the meaning of little children, right? There are two words in, that He uses uh, in the book of 1 John. One is a little child. Uh, a, a child. One is little children. Little children means... Uh, you are already uh, a little older and you are able to be instructed okay, by a parent. So as little children, we need to... How do you abide as little children? As a little child, do not overcomplicate the Christian life. Okay? And so when John says little children, it implies that abiding in Christ is simple. Okay? Not something that you need a graduate degree to understand or practice. Okay? You don't have to go to a Bible college or a seminary to understand what it means to abide in Christ. Okay? So the only question you need to ask yourself is this. Do I spend consistent regular time alone with the Lord in the Word? You don't have to have a college degree to read the Bible. If you know how to read English, then you're okay. If you don't know how to read English, meron po tayong Bisayan Bible. Meron rin tayong Tagalog Bible. Na kung di mo alam yung dalawa na yun, kapampangan ka, we also have a kapampangan version. Do you know that all the versions in the Philippines is in you version? In this app in the, in the, in your mobile device? I thought it was all English. When I start che checking the other versions offered by you version, meron ring Tagalog, may Bisaya, may Ilonggo. So wala talaga tayong rason that you cannot spend time reading the Word. Okay? Now, are you trusting in God and drawing near to Him in prayer? You don't need a graduate uh, degree for that to pray to the Lord. You know, prayer is what? Talking to Him. And if, you can, if we can talk to one another, then we can also talk to God. Right? You can talk to God and that's called prayer. Are you memorizing passages in Scripture as you meditate on God's Word? And are you applying it in your life? So do you have the discipline of memorizing passages? Okay? Why is that important, to memorize passages? So that when you need it, you can remember if you have a problem, you encounter a situation, and you're, for you to be able to escape that situation, then you have this in your back memory, all of these passages, because you've memorized it. I remember when I was new in CCF, I attended the Bible study of Pastor Peter at AIM. When he started, he was teaching us the book of Galatians. Sabi niya, okay, this is our first day of class. I'm going to give you an incentive. If you can memorize 10 verses, every week I'll give you one verse. If you can memorize 10 verses, I'm going to give you a Bible. Sabi ko, ano kayang Bible yung bibigay niya? Di ba? So for the next 10 weeks, I, I memorized the verses that he gave. So after the 10 weeks, he asked the class, we were about 
maybe 50. How many of you participated in my uh, memory, <laughs> memory burst program? Only three people went down after the class. Me and two ladies. So Pastor Peter said, okay, verse one. I memorized, go, go, go. Verse two, the next verse. And as I was growing in the Lord, what Peter Tanchier, senior pastor, asked us to memorize are the 10 verses that we use in sharing the gospel. Okay? First verse, John 10, 10. Diba? The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come so that you will have abundant life. Yun yung first verse. Second verse is Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the third verse was, ano yung third verse? Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death. Di ba? And then our next verse, mahaba-aba. Revelations chapter 21 verse 8. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, the immoral persons, the sorcerers, and the idolaters, and all liars, their place will be in the in a lake burning with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Okay? So it's very important that you and I memorize. Because one of my members in, in my D group in Manila memorized a very short verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Flee immorality. That long word lang eh. Flee immorality. So he memorized that verse. When he was invited by his friends, and his, his friends started to give him a girl, and they told him, I think I shared this with you guys, for some of you who were here in the past. His friend said, Brad, bayad na yan. Meaning he can do anything with the girl. He can bring the girl to her room in the hotel, and they can have sex. But because he memorized the passage, what's the passage again? Flee immorality. So boom, God spoke to him, flee immorality. And then immediately told his friends, Brad, I'm going to leave tomorrow early. I need to go back to the hotel. I need to sleep. He avoided falling into sin. Okay? And Psalm 119 says what? How can a young man keep his way pure? How? So that you will not sin. How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to his word. Meaning, you memorize the word of God. Okay? So, As a little child, okay, another is, don't complicate the Christian life. As a little child, humble yourself. Do not think highly of yourself. Paul tells us, do nothing from selfish or empty conceit, but, but contrast with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. The problem with a lot of people is this. They think they're better than the others. I like what Francis Kong, my good friend, posted in his, uh, in his uh, Facebook. Can we read this together? Go. Some people are so good in making other people look bad. That is not a gift. That is a sickness. Strong people bring out the best in others. Weak people build themselves up at the expense of others. So, be strong and do not be weak. And I experience that oftentimes when I work in the corporate world. People will, when you take over in a certain position, the tendency is to bring down the person that you replace, right? You will start saying, why is this happening? Why did you do this? Bakit ganit? You know? I still believe that uh, when you replace somebody, for example, you need to make sure that what the person has built up, you just build on it. Understand? Just build on it. If this is what they were able to produce, then build on that and improve. It's like cell phones, right? You might think that S7 is already the best Samsung phone. And here comes S8. Diba? Wow, then your S7 becomes eh, parang low, low quality na yung S7 mo. And now you will say, wow, ang ganda ng S8. And then here comes S9. Then your S8 looks... Uh, and if they come out with the S10 next year, if you have an S9 now, 
your S9 will not be in comparison with the S10. Di ba? Kaya I told you in our one of my sermon, I wanted to buy my wife the most advanced sa Samsung S26. Di ba? Remember that? <laughs> Gatas yun, hindi yun cellphone. Okay? S26. Okay? So, as little child, humble yourself. Do not think what? Highly of your self. Okay? Number three, as a little child, revel in the father's great love for you. Like father and children, every father loves his children, no matter what kind of father that is. Okay? They love their children with a special love. And so John, later on in chapter 3, will explain that to us. Okay? But it is important that if you're a child of God, you, you enjoy the love of the father. Okay? So that's the meaning of what? To be ready for Christ, you abide in him, and you abide in him as what? Little children. Okay? Don't complicate the Christian life. Some people, they complicate the Christian life. So we call them legalists, okay? Because they have so much requirement that it is so difficult to enter heaven, right? It's so difficult because why? You need to do this, you need to do this, you need to do this. I remember uh, a mother came to me six years ago, I think. They're not from CCF, so he, she asked me, Pastor, do you officiate weddings? I said, yeah, of course. I have a license to, to officiate uh, weddings. I said, why? I said, because my son wants to get married. Okay. Is he, is he a member of CCF? Then no. Oh, I'm sorry. Because it is required of us as officiating ministers that we only officiate weddings if one of the couple is a member of the church where I am. So meaning, if you want to get married with another person, which is not from CCF, I can still marry you because you are part of a member of CCF. But this son of hers is from another church. So I said, why will your pastor not marry your son? Because he's not a member, the mother said. How long have you been in the church? Uh, maybe almost 20 years. What? 20 years? And your son is not a member? Why is that? I said. Because our requirement, before we become a member of our church, we need to go through one training, second, third, fourth, Pepsi. Ang daming training and seminars na dadaanan bago ka maging before you become a member. But if you're attending our GLC, the membership here in CCF is very simple. You just attend a membership class, which is uh, a one-session class. And after the session, you decide at the back of the booklet, there is a form that you just fill up and say, I want to be a member. Submit it, then you're a member of CCF. But in their church, it is so complicated to become a member. That's why the pastor cannot wed the son. So I told the, the mother, that is the reason why the pastor cannot uh, marry your son because he is not a member. Understand? Okay? But I... I told them, I can officiate, but you have to look for a judge or a mayor who is authorized to declare and of, uh, declare the marriage uh, final or it's already done. But I will not sign the contract because your son and the future wife is not a member of CCF. So, but I still counsel them. And then when the wedding was almost there, I asked them, do you have already a judge or a mayor who will declare that you are married? No, wala pa nga pastor eh. Ah, sabi ko, wala. E kung wala kayo nun, we cannot go on with the wedding. Okay, two weeks from now. But what happened was, uh, the week before, we ran a membership class. And so I asked them, do you want to be a member of CCF? Uh, yes, pastor. Oh, then attend the membership class. So they attended the membership class a week before, and so they sign and said, we want to be a member. I said, you don't have to look for a mayor or a judge. I can officiate the wedding and I can also sign your marriage contract because you are members of 
CCF. But some churches, they complicate everything. Okay? So, what's the title today? Be ready for Christ coming. How do you prepare? You abide in Him. Okay? And as you abide in Him, abide in Him as little children. Let's bow our heads and let's just uh, thank the Lord. Father in heaven, we know that your, your Son is coming anytime. It's not a question of if He will come or not. The question is when will He come? But Lord, you have commanded us to prepare and the preparation requires that we abide in Him, remain in Him. And we remain in Him with an attitude of little children. Father, I pray that if there, if there is anybody here who still think that he will shrink away in shame in the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, that you will speak to him. Allow him to understand that abiding in your son is very important. And part of that is being born again being able to experience the new birth. And this new birth can only happen because this is the work of the Holy Spirit. And I pray, O oh God, that you will draw that person to you, allow that person to be taught, and allow him to hear, allow him to understand so that he will come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Grant him the repentance, because repentance is a gift, and grant him the faith to believe. Even the faith comes from you, O oh Lord. And so, Father, I pray that whoever that person is in this room who is not confident, when Jesus comes, I pray, O oh God, that he will, she will surrender her life, his life to the Lord Jesus Christ and believe that in the person and the works of the Lord Jesus, that he died on the cross, he was buried, and on the third day rose again from the dead. And, if you, and you promise that if we believe by faith, then we have forgiveness of sin and we can receive your gift of eternal life. Father, as we depart, I pray that you will keep us safe. Do not allow accidents or evil men to harm us until we reach our next destination. Give us a rested evening tonight, O God. And Father, I pray for my trip tomorrow to Manila. And as I prepare and review my talk, I pray, Lord, that you continue to give me wisdom so that I can share truth and principles to your servants in Luzon. And so, Lord, uh, I thank you even for the privilege to be able to minister to them. We thank you, Father. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.